if you're looking at Chanel and his 10 steps that he's got in this particular article. So basically, he spends about a page or two talking about each of the 10 for those of you that haven't had a chance to read it. And again, it's the reading that's in your Topic 2 folder. These are the 10 steps. And in Chanel's mind, this is the order in which you would do them. And he's close. Not quite exact, but close. Um, what I would argue is that you're going to move a couple of things around. And the way in which we've moved them aligns quite nicely to the course. And I'll explain sort of why the rationale is for that. Um, and where you should be in that process right now. You should be on step one. You should be thinking about the things that you are interested in. And I say things because for some of you, it's a thing, but you don't quite know how that's going to end up narrowing. You know, you've got sort of one broad topic in mind. For a couple of you, you've got a couple of three topics in mind. For some of you, you're not quite sure yet. And that's okay. That's all part of step one. By the time you come here next week, you want to have one or more topics. And by topics, I mean sort of broad topics in mind. You know, so for those of you that weren't quite sure what you were doing yet, you want to have something to work with. What Kim is going to do with you next week is she's going to teach you essentially how to search through the databases to find out what literature exists with your particular topic right now. So for those of you that have more than a single topic, what it will allow you to do over the course of the following week, so essentially after next Monday, it will allow you to essentially determine, okay, I'm finding a lot of literature about this topic. I'm not finding that much about this particular topic here, so it probably behooves me to pick the one that I'm finding lots of stuff about. At least from a pragmatic perspective, that's sort of where I would lean. Um, having said that, if you have a single topic right now, and you start searching and you're not finding that much about it, there are likely two possibilities. A, the way in which you're searching about it is probably too narrow and you sort of need to think about what does this mean in a broader context. Um, to use my own work as an example, you know, if I were searching, and, and this wouldn't happen now because there's a decent amount of literature available about it, but if I were searching for K-12 online learning and I wasn't finding a lot of stuff, if I sort of broaden that to look at K-12 distance ed, so as opposed to focusing specifically on distance ed that's delivered in an online format, just looking at distance ed in a more broader format, I would likely find a greater range of literature. Now, in my case, there's a fairly decent body of literature with both, so I wouldn't have to worry about that. You know, but if you were looking at something like the flipped classroom, as an example, you know, the term flipped classroom has really only been common for the last couple of years. But really, what are we talking about when we're talking about a flipped classroom? online component of your teaching? Not necessarily online. Think again from a more broader context. If you are flipping your classroom, what are you actually doing? I'm willing to bet that most of you when you were in school probably went to a flipped classroom, although they didn't call it that. Yeah. I mean, basically, that's what we're looking at when we're looking at a flipped classroom. For those of you that didn't hear, essentially, it's, well, do the work at home and then come into class and talk or do something about it. Most of us, looking around the room in terms of pegging most people's age, probably went to school at a point in time where most of the people, when they were assigned reading or homework to do at home, probably did it when they went home. So that way, when you walked into the room the next morning, your teacher could reasonably assume that the majority of you already had some understanding, knowledge, and facility with the content. So they didn't have to go and reteach that stuff again. They could actually do interesting things with the content. Whether or not they did interesting things is a different story, but we all, for the most part, grew up in a generation where that was the expectation. You know, the flipped classroom is just a fancy way of saying, I'm going to make the students do the reading and the homework at home so I can do some interesting things in the classroom. Now, the technologies that I'm using to do that are slightly different, but when you're actually looking at the instructional and pedagogical strategies behind it, that's what you're talking about. So if I were doing a literature search on flipped classroom and I'm not finding that much, I need to start to dissect, well, what 
is the flipped classroom really? What are some other ways of describing what's happening in a flipped classroom that might have a longer history, that might have a broader body of literature that I can draw upon to inform my understanding of what's actually taking place in my classroom? Right? So in some cases, if you've got a topic that you're searching and you're not finding a lot of stuff, it may be because the term that is being used to describe whatever it is that you're looking at today isn't necessarily the term that we would have been used a decade ago or two decades ago. Because you know, let's face it, there's not a lot in education that is particularly new in terms of instructional strategies or instructional design or pedagogy. Um, you know, that if you sort of break it down to its component parts, you can't find something to do with it. Now, having said that, if you've got a topic that has used a consistent term throughout time, you know, that means in theory, as you start searching, you might find things that go back into the 20s and 30s, um, as an example. You know, as you start doing your literature review, and we'll talk a little bit about this when we get to class three in particular, you're going to start to set some parameters, and Kim will show you how to do some of those things when you go about searching. You know, if the nature of your topic has changed for one reason or another because of dictates from the state or through particular pieces of legislation that were passed by this body or that body, and that has caused significant changes in your field, that might be a good particular period to select as a cutoff date for your instruction. You know, so if you're looking, for example, at standards-based teaching, standards-based teaching isn't something new. It's something that, you know, has a, a literature base that, well, I can think Gagne talked about it back in the 40s. Now, unfortunately or unfortunately, depending upon how you see the current political climate, standards-based teaching has taken on a completely different meaning and has taken on a completely different action under No Child Left Behind and some of the other federal dictates that have come down. You know, so if you were doing something on standards-based teaching, Gagne is probably not going to be all that useful to you, writing back in the 40s and 50s. Whereas things that have been written since this sort of, you know, current regime of, you know, drill and kill, test, you know, whatever you want to call it, and I could call it many things and most of them are not nice, um, has come down, you know, so limiting my search as I'm looking at it to 2001 in the present would likely be a good idea if that was my particular area of interest. You know, if you're looking at, say, market-based reform initiatives within education, you know, while there have been market-based reform initiatives since the mid-50s, really it's only been since the advent of the first voucher school in Minneapolis and really 1991 that you've started to see it in a big way under its current climate. You know, and charter schools and some of the other uh, initiatives that have been brought into place all followed from that. So again, <laughs> if I were searching that kind of ter topic, I might pick 1991 as my starting point because stuff that was before 1991 isn't necessarily valid, you know, based upon what I'm looking at today in my own professional context. And so these are some of the things that you, you're going to be looking at as you start to reflect on what interests you. But that's really the first stage. Coming into class next week when Kim is going to show you how to actually utilize these databases in, in an effective way. Figure out, okay, what are the things I'm interested in looking at to see what I can find? And is it a single thing? Do I have a couple of topics that I've got to decide from? Or is it just one that I sort of need to figure out, is this going to have enough out there to sustain me for this? The second, and this is the first change that I have with the way Ron has set up his sequencing, is the second phase is to actually conduct a literature review. And as I said at the beginning of the class, you know, if you are going to do a systematic piece of research, it is totally a waste of time to decide what that's going to be and to set that up and to figure out what your research purpose and questions and methodology and all those other things are going to be until you actually know what's known in the field. You might be proposing a study that we already know the answer to. And wouldn't that be a waste of 12 months? You know, or for that matter, if we were to do it in the sequence that Ron says, sometime in June you would be realizing that everything that I want to answer here I already know the answers to because there's already 30 people that have done studies on this. Yeah. Or you might discover that, well, we can't answer that yet because we've got to answer these three other things before we even get to that stage. 
One of the things that most of the authors that you read are going to do near the end of their articles is they are going to say, based upon what we found in this study, here's what we think you should study next. As you start to see the same things appearing again and again in these articles, that's going to give you a pretty good idea of if I'm interested in X, here are two or three different studies that everyone in the field says need to be done. And that's really how you're going to start to figure out you know, what your topic focus is. You know, as you start to look through the literature, you're going to notice that there are themes or trends in the literature. In some cases, these may be standalone themes. In some cases, you may notice what we would call a funneling effect. So essentially, you'll see that the literature starts off very broadly, and then as the field grows and becomes more sophisticated, it becomes quite narrow in terms of its focus. You're going to notice one of the two things will happen. I can guarantee that one of the two things will happen. And throughout the examples that I provide on a weekly basis, including the two that we'll look at in a second, those will actually show you, you know, those kinds of models. I think I've got one of each here tonight, to be exact. That's really where we're going to be once we fit, finish this particular part of the course. You know, we're going to be at a place where your topic has been refined enough that you will be able to propose your initial questions. You know, so as I'm moving through the sequencing, essentially, this is the way in which the sequencing works. So this is 689, this is 690, this is 691. And again, I'll have these slides, and for that matter, recording of this up in Blackboard sometime tonight, so you don't have to worry about jotting them down. Um, and if you're looking at it in terms of how this shakes down, the first three items that Chanel, or that I had Chanel talking about, so one, six, and three, that's essentially your chapter two. These two items are the first paragraph or so of your chapter three. And that's where we stop in this course. Your chapter two done, and then essentially the only part of chapter three you'll have is the purpose of this thesis study is this purpose leads to the following research question or questions, and then you have those there. That's where we stop in this class, and then Charles picks you up, and you'll decide upon what methodology is appropriate to answer those questions, what data collection methods you're going to use, what data analysis methods you're going to use, how you're going to ensure reliability and validity, and then you're actually going to conduct the study and come up with thematic results for each of your questions, and then you're going to tie it all together in Chapter 5 with your conclusions, implications for practice, and suggestions for future research. That easy. Kind of. <laughs> in 690, you are going to essentially do Chapter 3, which is your methodology chapter. You're also going to come back and do Chapter 1, and you'll do them in that order, um, largely in part because you want to make sure you get your Chapter 3 done. As long as you've got Chapter 3 done by the end of 690, you're still in good shape. Because Chapter 1, in all honesty, can really be done at any stage. And for most people, it's only about four or five pages anyway. Um, it's a very short, sort of very brief introduction uh, that you'll do. And you'll do it at some point between when you finish Chapter 3 and when you actually start Chapter 4. I say other there because this is one that, well, he says that you should do it. And it's actually not a bad idea. It doesn't actually fit in any of the chapters. Basically, what he's saying there is once you've determined that you are going to be doing, say, interviews and observations as part of your data, data collection, if you've never done an interview with the particular population that you're doing, like an actual research interview, not necessarily talking to someone, but it's not a bad idea to actually do a couple to practice in advance to make sure that you can do that. When you get to 691, you basically have two tasks left. Um, the first is to write your chapter 4, which is your results and discussion. So there's two parts to it. Results, basically, what does the data tell you? You know, it's going to be organized by research question. Each of the research questions are likely going to be answered with thematic results of some kind. And then the discussion portion is basically where you discuss what you found in light of what you already knew. So essentially, how do the results jive with the literature that you started off with? And then chapter 5, um, I don't like the way he says this because it's compose and submit your report, assuming that that would be sort of, you know, that really you're doing parts of your report along the way. Um, but really chapter 5 is three sections. They're all about a page or two long. It's a conclusion, so where you summarize everything that you've done over the past 12 months. 
implications for practice. So based on what you learn, what should practitioners in whatever context you were working in do because of what you learn, and then suggestions for future research. If you were to come into my 689 class a year from now and someone was interested in studying what you had just studied, what's two or three things you would tell them need to be studied based upon what you just found? All right? That's essentially your thesis. So if you're looking at aligning Chanel's 10 steps to how this looks, that's kind of the way in which it 